afternoon, everybody. Everybody, everybody have a good time down at practice. Well, thank, thanks for everybody to come out today. We Today's Talk Chalk is presented by American Family Insurance and organized by the Players' Tribune, which is a new media company that provides athletes with a platform to connect directly with their fans in their own words. And we're going to get a lot of that today from our two guests. The site was founded by Derek Jeter. The Players' Tribune publishes first-person stories from athletes, providing unique insight into the daily sports conversation. Through impactful and powerful long- and short-form stories, video series, podcasts, and live intimate conversations such as today's Chalk Talk, the Players' Tribune brings fans closer than ever to the games that they love. Our conversation today will also be live streamed on Blue Jeans Network and will be archived on the Players' Tribune. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first guest, who I'm sure all Packer fans know very well. He's from Virginia Tech, a third-round draft pick, and a member of the Super Bowl 31 championship team in Green Bay, Antonio Freeman. And in keeping with that theme, another third round pick from the University of Texas and a member of the Super Bowl 45 championship team, Jermichael Finley. A little warm in here, huh? They put us in the sauna. <laughs> well, we want to keep the fans content. So, guys, I guess, you know, the first thing, you know, we're here in, in the dream zone, and I always find it interesting. You guys, you know, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and kind of your first step as far as how you became who you guys have become. Um, well, first of all, I was fortunate enough to be raised in the inner city of Baltimore by both my parents. I had my dad and my mom there, so I had consequences. I got a lot of butt whippings, um, and, and school was always big, first. Big, big cheers for the butt whippings. <laughs> and school was always first. Sports was second. I couldn't play sports unless I made good grades and had good conduct in school. Well, my conduct was always the problem. It wasn't the grades, actually. Some things never change. <laughs> and, um, you know, through that, um, I, I, I got accepted into a, 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 a really good uh, academic high school where I was able to play football, recruited by Virginia Tech, played five years there, and uh, fortunately I was drafted by probably the greatest franchise in NFL history, and I had a nine-year career. So, so I guess as you're growing up, when did that, when did your, what was your first dream? Did you dream immediately about being an NFL player, or what? You know, just in growing up, what was that first thought of what you were going to do with yourself? My first thing that I thought I would be was a NBA basketball player because my mother never let me play football because she said I was too skinny, I was too small, and I was going to get my bones broke. So I played basketball throughout my teenage years, and in my 11th grade year, my mom let me play football for my high school. What? Le what? Why 11th grade? Why did she let you do it? I just worried the heck out of her. To the point where she just said, get out there. And uh, I rode the bench as a junior in high school. I wasn't a starter until my senior year. And when I got the opportunity to start, uh, I broke a lot of records in the state of Maryland as far as receiving goes and got a chance to go to school for free. So that was my dream is to first get a scholarship. And that NBA dream was was gone. No go. Michael, <laughs> how about you as uh, growing up? A little bit about your upbringing and, and, and uh, you know, when your first idea of what you thought, could you be a professional football player? Uh, man, I was I was raised in a little town in Texas where football was, you know, I mean, it was crazy. But I was raised by my grandmother. Uh, she was very, very adamant about me, you know what I mean, just being successful. And uh, she was on my butt every second of the day. And uh, I, I just don't get why 
uh, parents go to jail now for spanking their kids. So, because I got, <laughs> oh man, uh, spankers, I got them gal galore. Uh, so, yeah, I was born in a small town, uh, raised by my grandmother, of course, and uh, now I'm here in uh, good old Green Bay. And we're happy that we're happy that you're here. I guess we always, when we're looking out and people are thinking about what they're going to do, people along the way that have guided you and helped you with the pursuit of those dreams. Tell us a little bit about, both of you guys, a little bit about maybe a few, a coach, someone in your family that maybe helped helped you get to where you guys are now. Growing, growing up, um, I was similar to free. Um, I wanted to be a basketball player. Um, I was recruited uh, to college, uh, the University of Arizona, to go play basketball. So my dream was to go to the NF M NBA. Um, then I got that call from uh, Mac Brown. He said, we want, you, we want you to come play football here at the University of Texas. So I was like, can't, I cannot down Texas football. So um, I verbally committed to Texas. And, um, and then after that, third round pick to Green Bay. And it was uh, probably the best dream of them all. What, what, were some of the, what were some of the things that these coaches or these people did to kind of help you be able to achieve those things? Oh, they, they pushed me. Uh, they was on my butt daily. Um, they was telling me, you can do it. You got it. Um, they were giving me the pep talks that I needed as a kid because um, I, was, I was raised up in poverty. Um, I didn't have much. Um, so I, I wanted to be successful. And that's what uh, drove me to uh, greatness. Well, for me, it was, it started at home for me, my mom and dad. They kept me away from trouble. They kept me busy. You know, they kept me in after-school activities, on basketball teams, on football teams, just allowing me to figure out what I liked as opposed to what they wanted me to do. And along the way, I had some great coaches, uh, even down to my basketball coach as a 10-year-old, going to summer camps, I, 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 a guy like Sam Cassell, who was a 16-year-old veteran, was a mentor for me growing up. He was a guy that, that helped steer me as well. What did Sam Cassell think about your basketball skills? Oh, he thought I could play, but I wasn't tall enough. So, that's why he's not a GM, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, that's why he was just a player and not a GM. But, you know, it's a small town of athletes in, in Baltimore. Carmelo Anthony, another one of those guys in our, our basketball tree in Baltimore. But I was okay in basketball, but... I was a little better in football, and through hard work and just pressing forward, I was able to achieve uh, a lot of my dreams. So along the way, you, know, you had people helping you. You had coaches. You had family members. Talk a little bit. There's nobody that gets to this level that hasn't had obstacles that they have to overcome. You know, what were some of the obstacles, not only in childhood, but also you know, before you got to Green Bay, some of the obstacles you had to overcome and how you went about overcoming them? I overcame a lot before I came here. Uh, like I said, I was I was raised up not having much. Uh, so going to actually college was uh, going for free on a scholarship was awesome. And uh, it was a, I got on that train ASAP. And uh, I got pushed when I got to Texas. Um, went, went through a couple injuries, uh, which we all know injuries are a mental. Uh, if, if you're not mentally prepared for it, uh, it, it can break you for sure. Well, for me, I was homesick. Born and raised in Baltimore. I went to school in Virginia Tech. So after I got to school, um, there were no cell phones then. You know, so. Dang, you're old, man. <laughs> so you had to have an access code to make a long distance code, a long distance call. And uh, this guy creatively came over to me and he said, man, if you want to call your friends, I have this code you can use and you can call for free. So I did it for about four months. No lie. I got away with it. Didn't get in trouble. So what do I do? I pass it on to you. I say, hey, here's this code I've been using for four months. The other guy gave it to me. So you use it. So I gave the code to you. You got caught. And you ratted me out. Not and me I got kicked out of school me. for a semester. <laughs> so that was one of those options where passing it forward wasn't a good idea. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, we had... You know, the getting, you know, setting your dream and then going about, you had obstacles, you had the people. Now let's get into what everybody wants to hear about your time with Green Bay, how you ended up coming to Green Bay, and then just initially your first impressions when you came into the city of Green Bay. Oh, man, when, when my name got called across that screen, third round, um, I had a friend here um, playing for the Packers at the time, 
And uh, he said, hey, one thing you got to bring is your Nintendo, every Nintendo game you got, because it is nothing to do here. And I was like, oh, man. Then I got off the plane, and it was cold. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, then I got here, then, I, then the fans embraced me um, to the max. I got to the facility. The coaches were awesome. Uh, McCarthy was here at the time. Uh, the players, uh, the community, um, I, I just, I, I couldn't ask for a better place to be. And I tell all the guys, if it's one place you want to play at, it's, it's Green Bay, Wisconsin, that's for yeah. sure. I'll start off by saying um, that Best Buy store that's located on Mason, they owe me a nine-year refund. Because when I came here, I too heard that there wasn't a lot to do, but football is great. Playing football on Sundays is phenomenal. And every Tuesday we had off, I probably spent $400 at Best Buy buying the newest DVD, the newest CD that came out. It didn't matter what kind of music it was. I spent a lot of money at that Best Buy trying to keep myself uh, busy uh, in Green Bay. But the, the greatest part for me was the camaraderie after practice. You know, you get defensive linemen who say, hey, we're going to meet up at the bar. Well, you've got wide receivers, running backs, safeties. We all hung out together. And that was one of the greatest things about playing for the Green Bay Packers is even though this is not considered a big city like New York, Chicago, or Dallas, it allowed us to be better friends, better teammates, and have a better football team. And that's what you come to Green Bay for is to play football and win games. And I couldn't ask for a better place after football, the camaraderie that we all shared as teammates year after year off the field. So, Free, you played in a few other places. Jermichael and I spent our time here. What was, what's the difference when you're in Philadelphia or if you're in Miami? What's the big difference? I know this, you, know, you mentioned a little bit, but what, for you, what was the big difference? Just a lot of different things to get in trouble with, you know. Too many bars, too many clubs, too many restaurants. It spells out trouble. So uh, being here, it allowed me to focus on football and, and being the best teammate, the best player I could be. And, you know, those other cities, they're fun. They're fun to hang out with, but there's no place like playing football in Green Bay. And I've been to games in Miami. I've been to games in Baltimore. I've been to games in Philly. Nothing compares to playing in Lambeau Field. Amen. So your transition from college to Green Bay, what were kind of the, I mean, what was the most difficult part? I know that, you know, there's the great things about, you know, the community, the football team, everything football related, but there had to be some things that were really difficult for you guys as well. I, I got to stick with the football related situation, but um, coming from University of Texas, Green Bay Packers, I, I, I went from a picture book, playbook, to a dictionary. And I'm like, man, what, what are they giving me here? Football, it do doesn't take that much. And uh, that, that was the one thing that uh, that was a struggle, um, which, which it is with any player that comes through is the, is the playbook and getting all that terminology down, getting all them kind of sort of things like that down. It was, it was tough now. It was a road. Well, I have to admit, going to college prepared me for my years in Green Bay. I went to Virginia Tech. It's in a small town called Blacksburg, Virginia, near Roanoke, Virginia, which is probably the biggest major city close. Um, and I got to focus on being a student, getting my degree, doing the things that I really went to school for. So when I came to Green Bay, although initially it was a little disappointing because I didn't even know where Green Bay was. I'm a true East Coast guy. I haven't been probably past the Virginia line you know, my whole life. Um, so I didn't know where Green Bay was. I knew it was a little chilly, but I didn't know it was brutally freezing cold. Um, so I had my struggles with that part of the transition. But, man, I mean, once you get here and you see everything is green and gold and everything is Packer-oriented, it makes you feel a lot better and it makes you feel like you're at home. Amen. So I guess you guys both had, you know, very nice long careers here in Green Bay. What's I, I have my own personal favorite memories of both you guys as teammates, but what is your favorite memory? And then what was maybe something that happened, a memorable play that 
happened in Green Bay that you kind of want to discuss in detail? Uh, my mine is, is, of course, is the Lambo leap, but you, you ain't never done a Lambo leap when you got to go from goal line to goal line. No huddle. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the Lambo leap doing no huddle drill is the most absurd thing. Them legs are so heavy. Then you got the fans up there with the Miller light. And I taste that thing on Wednesday when in my in my chin shop. I taste it. I'm like, oh yeah, I got that Sunday in the Lambo leap for sure. So that was uh that was the most experienced moment I ever had. It was awesome. I have to agree with you, Michael. I mean, doing a Lambo leap is is so exciting. I mean, you 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 dream about those moments at night. And then the next game, you don't score. You dream about it two weeks later, and then you don't score. So it's so unexpected, unlike being a running back, when you probably plan to score two or three times a game and not jump in the stands. As wideouts and, and, and skilled guys, we look forward to those jumps in the stands. And I, like Jermichael, look forward to them, that drop or two of fresh beer and a ketchup stain with brats as I run to the sideline. So... Those memorable moments that not only do we share with our teammates, we get to share with fans who we don't even know, but we know there's a lot of love there between the two of us. So the Lambo Leap is a phenomenal thing. Free, did you ever worry about getting high enough to get into the stands? I, the one time that I was fortunate to catch a pass, I made sure I looked for the low-angled side right now. Back when it was the older stadium where you could go, like, was this high? Did you ever miss? No, after Leroy... There's video, there's video. Hey, after Leroy Butler tried the initial Lambo leap and he stuck to the wall <laughs> like he was Spider-Man, it can't get any worse than that. So, yeah, when I was one of those guys, when I scored, I didn't go down the middle. I looked to the corners because the walls are a little lower. So you can kind of go up and then, like, sit on the wall, more or less, and look back as opposed to doing a full dive in. Think about that Lambo leap. You better make it because you're going to hear it on Monday for sure. They're going to let you know. That film always comes back. Yeah, no doubt about that. It's going to come back for sure. So, J. Mike, I, I just remember, and I'm sure this is a fond memory for you, the 2009 end of the season when we went up to Pittsburgh and you were the baddest man on the field and up in Arizona in the playoff game. What Tell the fans, what does it feel like to be – I mean, every defense was coming at you with every different coverage, and you, for that stretch, were unstoppable. Yeah, man, it, having that – you know I mean? It's a good and bad to that, but having that target on your back in the NFL is not good because everybody is shooting for you. Everybody wants to hurt you. But it, it was awesome um, coming in here as a, as a young, young kid. I was 20, 21 years old um, coming out, having a, a breakout game. Um, I got very, very comfortable. That's when I started playing ball. And um, it was one of those things where good old Mark Tauscher was in the locker room with me, too. So it was awesome. And Free, I think everybody out here is going to remember remember Al Michaels, the Monday night game out here at Lambeau. And he did what? How did that? I mean, the concentration you showed and what kind of just go through that, because that play, I mean, there's pictures of it over at the stadium. It is one of the most legendary plays in the entire history of this long storied franchise. I'll get to that real quick. I just wanted to say something briefly real quick, Tosh. I was talking to Jermichael before we came on stage and I just was thinking to my head and I said, man, if you would have stayed healthy, what those guys doing, uh, Gronkowski and those other tight ends, this guy would have been way better than those guys. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because he's here. He was a he was a matchup nightmare. I mean, this guy, you had to put a defensive back on him to cover him. So that gave our offense uh, a lot more balance. And when you lose a guy of his talent and his ability, it does change the, the flow of the offense and how the offense is run. So I just wanted to... Free, before you jump back in, now I'm going to jump back in. There is no doubt in 09 and 010 before he got hurt, this man was unstoppable. You teams could not figure out a way to stop Jermichael Finley. And I'm talking playoff games, six catches for 159 yards when everybody knew where he was. And our offense was unstoppable, not only because of his production, but the way defenses had to play. And there isn't a doubt in my mind. You see what these tight ends, Gronk and some of these other tight ends are doing. 
There is no more gifted pass-catching tight end than Jermichael Finley was. And even if we worked hard on it, he became a pretty good run blocker. It took a while. That was he tough. wasn't interested in that early. I can promise you that. But it is, it's a testament. Jermichael is a special talent. There's no doubt. Stop it, man. Y'all making me blush, man. We're trying to get J. Mike emotional today. Please. Absolutely. Uh, back, back to the uh, Monday night catch against Minnesota. It was actually a play that we practiced every Monday. But only Brett and I was there. Nobody else got to see us practice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it was just a tough game. It was raining, and I remember my quarterback coming up to the line. And we had a rule. If the quarterback changes the play and gives you an audible, you give it back to him, and it doesn't change. Well, Brett came up to the line, and he gave me the audible for sluggo, which meant run a fake slant and then go. I'll pop it in the back of the end zone. Well, the ball blew away, so they had to reset the ball. And the Vikings knew our calls. They knew our signals. So when we realigned at the line, they acted as if they were going to go to zone. And I was like, man, this play is no good against zone. And at the last minute, they came down and they blitzed anyway. But because they knew what we were running, Chris Dishman was able to make a, a, a good defensive play on it. I mean, he came down, he deflected the ball. The only thing is, I was going, I made a play for the ball. And as I was going down, I was putting two hands out trying to catch myself. And I felt a, something tap my left shoulder. And, you know, you got to have good peripherals as an athlete. <laughs> so my peripheral vision saw a, a dark object just still on a decline like this. So I reached my hand out. I looked at it briefly, and I'm like, oh, snap, this is a football. <laughs> so I get up, and the first person I look for is Robert Griffith, one of the hardest, strong, hitting strong safeties in the game. And, he was on a direct beeline from the other side of the field. And I caught him again with that peripheral. So I gave him a sidestep. And then the coach was clear. I was able to just jog on into the end zone. And yeah. that was the first time I ever got carried off the field. Did, did you, you did the leap after that, didn't you? Did you not? I kind of did a, a pushback leap. I wanted to jump, but I kind of like put my foot on the, on the wall because I'm such a high jumper. And I pushed myself back. <laughs> So I gave him a fake leap. That was that was one of the all-time great moments, and it's always great to beat the Vikings as well. So now I think a lot of people obviously want to know. We've all been fortunate, and this franchise fan base has been fortunate for the last 25, 30 years to have two of the all-time great quarterbacks. You guys were fortunate to be drafted into it where you just had to come on board. What was it like, Free and then Jermichael, Free for you, when you first came in, Brett Favre is already establishing himself as a big-time player. How do you come in, and what's your first interaction with Brett? First thing he said to me is, you got a shot to make it here, but you got to study the playbook, son. <laughs> and uh, when I saw the playbook, like Jermichael said, it's, it's probably this tall, and you have to know everything in it. And uh, I just remember walking in. I was a young guy. I was... Had a lot of veteran receivers, uh, Mark Ingram, Robert Brooks, Anthony Morgan, just to name a few. And uh, I was just trying to make the team. I said, if I can be a punt returner or a kick returner my first year, man, I made it to the NFL. Like, how cool is that? I wasn't even thinking of being a starter. I'm like, man, if I could just be a punt returner, I'm cool with that. And throughout my time here, Brett was so much help. He was a guy that you could go to and ask, hey, what did I do wrong? What could I do different? And he would tell you and direct you into those things. So the first thing I learned is forget the coach. Listen to your quarterback. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we were just able to create a great chemistry just from hard work and practice because I spent a lot of time my rookie year practicing with the first team because those veteran guys, as you know, they were hurt on Wednesday. They were hurt on Thursday. So I had to practice. And then on Friday, these guys miraculously get healthy. And now they're the starters on Sunday. After I put in all, bitter, man. After I put in all the hard work during the week, now they miraculously get healthy. But I didn't realize that was preparation for my next year when I earned the starting position. That was an audition time for me to show the coach what a young kid could do 
and give them an idea that they could get, they could have confidence in me. So I didn't realize that those practices that they were making me practice was really an audition for me to become the starting receiver next to Robert Brooks the very next year. Hey, Free, before we go to Jermichael, what what was the was there a moment when it was like, man, I think I've earned Brett's trust because I'm going to ask Jermichael about that after he gets into it. But trust with a quarterback and a wider is so big. When did you kind of know that you established that and that you guys had a good rapport? It really wasn't until my third year, my second year as a starter, because my rookie year, I, stuck, I struggled with the dropsies. You know, I, 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 I made some plays, and I was a good part of uh, us winning the Super Bowl uh, our second year. But I broke my arm that same year, so I missed four games. And it was at the point where right when I got to week number eight, I had got that confidence. And then week number nine, I get my forearm broke. So now I'm out for another four weeks. And now I'm thrusted back in week 13. And it was against the Bears. My first game back with a cast on my arm. I bet nobody was coming at that arm either. They, hey, I, get back. Get back. And when Brett threw to me the first three pass attempts of my game when I came back, that's when I really knew how important I had to be to make this uh, help this offense be successful. And Jermichael, you know, I'm fascinated by the relationship you and Aaron. What was your first interaction? And then kind of talk about the evolution of your guys' relationship. First, the first time I got here, uh, I saw Aaron. He's like, big fella, we're going to need you, big fella. I'm like, hold on. I just walked in the door here. Hold on. So we did that. We went through it. We got the practice. And when I say it's like playing with Aaron Rodgers, is like doing calculus and, and chemistry, that – that guy right there, he adds so much extra to the game, and it's it's good for to get the defense off. Uh, the, the snap count is different. Uh, the the hand signals is totally different. Um, I, I think we spend we spent more time in the classrooms than we did on the field because Ann Rogers, he was really smart, a really detailed guy. And he wants you to get that thing right. You know about it. Yeah. So, J. Mike, tell the fans a little bit what. What happens when you run a route two yards short? What? Well, <laughs> just trying to get into what? What's Aaron like when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing? What? What I just did. He just. He. I. When he hits you with that little look, it ain't good. And it's that. It's that just stare like in the headlights look. It's like, yeah, you. I ain't throwing to you the next. You. You ain't getting the ball no more this game. <laughs> and you want that rock, so you better. If if it's a five yard route, it better be five yards. So it's like really, really detailed. You gotta love him for it. That's what that's what made he made him what he is today. He's a he's an awesome player, awesome teammate, and uh, he's uh he's gonna be a Hall of Famer one day for sure. So he, I mean, yeah. For, so he put high expectations on you, and I'm assuming that ended up making you a better player. He made he made me an awesome player. Um, before I got out, the last three years, um, I had to meet Aaron Rodgers. McCarthy came to me. He was like, "Hey, you two guys, you need to get together." So I'm like, "All right." What, what we got to do here. So uh, Saturday Saturday nights before the game, uh, we had, it was like a boyfriend-girlfriend thing. And, <laughs> and uh, McCarthy. It was monogamous. Yeah. Aaron, a A-Rod is on his bed with his little robe, like, leaned up like this. And uh, I got to go in there. We got to talk about the next, uh, that Sunday, that Sunday uh, game or whatnot. And uh, we going over the plays. We doing this and that. I'm like, man, does it take all of this? to go out here and play some football. And that was my thing, but uh, it, it was awesome. Um, he helped me out uh, a ton, and uh, I love him for that. No doubt. That's what makes both those guys great. Uh, again, a little reminder, our conversation today is being live streamed on Blue Jeans Network and will be archived on the Players' Tribune. And I think you know, we're so fortunate as players to have those quarterbacks. Free, you played with some other teams. I think the biggest thing when people ask me, it's, it gives your team the belief that you can win every game when you have that quarterback. What is it like when you were playing in some places that didn't have that quarterback? Oh, you miss a guy like Brett Favre. Again, one of his key assets was he was approachable. You could go to him and ask questions, and he would put you in the place where he wanted you to be. So you better find that place where he wants you to be. When you go to other places, you go to other cities. So there's other things that captivate guys' mind. What restaurant are we eating at after practice? That's not the focus that you have as a Green Bay Packer when I've gone other places. 
Quarterbacks don't have the desire to stay an extra hour and watch a can of film either by themselves or invite their receivers in. It's what's it's just what Jermichael said. It's the stuff that's done behind the scenes when no one's looking, when no one's watching, when the reporters are sleeping. Those are the crucial moments that really create and help make greatness. And that's why you're able to see greatness with him and Rodgers, with Favre and myself. It's the extra time. And if you have a superstar stud quarterback who's willing to put in the extra time a lot of cases, you're looking at guys like Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre, Drew Brees, the guy up in New England that deflated the footballs, Peyton Manning. <laughs> Those are the guys who put that extra effort in, and you get great results. So I, I guess before we move move on from that, what what do you guys think? So those guys, what did it mean for you guys as players to have those two as your guys? It means a ton. Uh, it makes it makes the things that we do a lot, lot easier uh, because, you know, they're going to get back there and do their job. Uh, they're going to get the ball to you for sure. And, uh, I mean, ha having a guy like I, – I didn't get to play with far, but having a guy like Ann Rogers, it just – it gives you that confidence on Sunday that you're going to go out there and play your best ball. Do you guys get this question a lot? I do when we're out. What's the biggest differences? You always get – who do you like better? And, you, you know, you always give the political answer on that. But just the differences and the similarities. But I, I'm kind of interested. I know you've been wa you watch Brett. You know a little bit about Brett. Antonio, you do a lot of media work. You So you study the team. What is the biggest differences between Aaron and Brett, in your opinion? You know, differences, there's a lot of similarities. And I'm sure Jermichael can att attest to this. With both of those guys, every receiver that lines up is capable of getting the ball thrown to him. You heard Tao say, well, you've been other places. Yeah, I've been other places where the quarterback is going to go to the first read, and if he's not there, he's getting rid of it. In this offense, whether it was with Favre or with Rodgers, you're number one, you're number two, the guy running the post, and your fullback flaring out in the flats are all viable receivers. So what those guys make you do is they make you run and play hard every down because you don't know, and there's no script to where the football is going. You just better be in the place where your quarterback wants you to be, and then there's a great deal of success. But when I think about Favre, I think about the ultimate gambler, the ultimate risk taker, the guy who had so much confidence in his arm and his receivers that he felt as though he could make every throw. I look at Aaron Rodgers, and I see more of a, of a perfectionist of a guy who's not going to rely on his arm to make that throw, but more or less rely on the system to dictate where he goes with the football. And to much of those guys' credit, they're great studiers. That's why they're great quarterbacks, is they're great stud studiers and they're approachable. And I, and I can speak on that about Rodgers. He, at the time when I was playing or whatnot, we had, who we have, Jordy Nelson, James Jones, Randall Cobb, uh, Greg Jennings, Donald Drival. I, I'm like, oh, man. Hey, we, yeah, that sounds we, like a pretty good lineup. Oh, good. man, it was tough getting that ball. So I'm like, man, I don't know how many catches we're going to have this game, but I know we're going to score a lot for sure because the, the, the guys we had on the field at the time, it was any 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 given play is going to be it's going to be touchdown for sure. Right. You know, the wide receivers and tight ends, you guys can kind of get the label as being divas, and you were just talking about that all-star lineup I mean you have you know a bunch of Packer Hall of Famers in there was it ever tough you're seeing Terrell Owens and you're seeing these other Gronk you're seeing these guys put up these huge numbers and you realize that your quarterback with with the coverages you get the ball's going to get spread out and you're not going to have those big numbers did that ever bother you guys um it, be honest oh uh, you know me now um uh it, it was I you know, mean you, you go into games um uh, uh you, you got to touch the ball. You got to get the ball early and often to get the feel for the game. And sometimes with the receiving core we had, I, I didn't touch the ball to the third quarter. So I'm like, oh, man, here we go. And um, it, it was one of those things that you had to gut through. You had to deal with it because you know you was going was, was gonna to score points. That's, that's at least. But your individual play, it, it might not be too good. <laughs> and I feel like if you're a competitor, it has to bother you. If you're not a competitor, then it might not bother you. But 
The one common denominator is winning. If I'm going to take a sacrifice for the football team, if, if Terrell Owens is going to have nine catches, as I'm going to have four, I want to at least win. So winning kind of trumped everything around here because you're a team in Green Bay. We, we, we were fortunate enough, as you mentioned, to have, I mean, two Paramount-type quarterbacks. But the whole motive around here is we win as a team. No doubt. I guess the, before we move forward on the transition out of the game, where is that line where, I mean, you're winning games, but you're not getting the individual stats because you are, you both, everybody's a competitor and they want to put those numbers up. But where is that line? If you start losing a few games, you still want to be a good teammate, but you're also you know, kind of upset that you're not getting the touches. It's always fascinating to watch because, you know, when you're winning, you can't really complain when you're winning because then you're a bad teammate. But if you're losing, you want to be more involved because you believe that you're going to be able to help the team win. Well, that line is, Trust in management, and that's just having the trust that management sees everything. They see the components that help make this team work collectively, and each part is equally as important. So you're trusting in the system that the folks upstairs who make the decisions and give out the money are not going to discount you because you kept your mouth shut and became a team player instead of a dynamic individual Type of type of player, so, and that's where the the line gets erased because we have trust in the people up top, but sometimes those deals don't always get worked out the way that we want to. But the one thing about Green Bay is, if you look at their roster over the last 30 years, we don't get a lot of free agents acquisitions during the off seasons. They like to build their draft picks up, keep those guys around, and build them up for eight to ten years before they're ever gone. So there's a tremendous amount of trust between player, coach, and the people upstairs uh, making the decisions. And that's, and like you just said, eight to 10 years, you hope you're able to get, you know, those, those years and, and be able to live your dream playing professional football, but for everybody, and I mean everybody, the clock stops. And I guess the, one of the questions I have, and I know we've all went through it, what's been the most difficult part now that your playing days are over? Uh, my, mine was is that um, I, I didn't go out the way I wanted. Um, I, I went out on a, a career-ending injury, a, a very, very dramatic injury, and uh, it, it was tough. Uh, the first year, uh, I'm going to be a little uncut here. We, I didn't cut football on in my house. Not one Sunday the first year I, I retired. Just too painful to watch? It, it was. Um, I love the Packers. Don't get it misunderstood. I just couldn't watch my guys go to battle with me not being there. And uh, my my son was like, Dad, it's Sunday. Where is the football at? I'm like, look, it's it's more to to, to that than, than what, you know what I mean? He's an eight-year-old now. He don't know the details to the struggle. So it, it, it was tough, man. But now uh, I'm very content. Uh, life is great. And um, I couldn't I couldn't ask for more. But Jay, Mike, but before Free kind of gets into his transition, I read a quote from your son when you were sitting after the injury on the field and you were sitting in the hospital and your son Caden said, I don't want you to play no more football, Daddy. I mean, that's powerful stuff. And I know you tried to make a comeback, but was that always in the back of your mind as when you were in your comeback mode and trying to figure out if you were going to come back and play? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it, it, it was in the back of mine. And, and what made it... Um, uh, Bad was it was right after the game. I was still concussed. Uh, my kid came to me and said, "I don't want you playing football anymore." And I was like, "I got gotcha. you." And um, after that wore off, um, I, I tried to make the comeback, and uh, I just didn't have the feel and uh, the confidence to go on the field and and go to battle because uh, one wrong hit uh, I for sure be a vegetable. Um, it, it was um, it was one of those plays that I wouldn't wish on. No player in the NFL. Um, it's the NFL is a it's a dangerous game. Once you go out there on that field, it's any given Sunday you'll be gone. And uh, I, I I commend them guys. Um, I'm a big advocate of it. So yeah. Well, much like Jamichael, he said one year I did two years of no football because um, it was kind of hard to watch something that you've been a part of since you were 10 years old and all of a sudden it's taken away from you forever. It was hard to watch some of your friends 
still go out there and do the things that they love to do, that we love to do, and I couldn't be a part of it. It was painful, and the transition is real. Never let anybody say the transition is easy. This is something we've been doing since we were kids. This is something people have patted us on our back for 20 plus years, and now all of a sudden it's gone. But the real transition was being at home. <laughs> I for, mean, your, for your gals, oh, probably. Oh, man. I mean, you're never home as a football player. You're at work 7 in the morning. You leave practice at 5. You might get home at 6, 7 o'clock. But that leaves you four hours with your family. On the weekends, we're traveling. We're preparing for a game. So you're kind of an invisible factor in your own home life. And now once the game's over, you're in the home full time now. So it's like, honey, take the trash out. Change the diaper. Do this. Do that. All of the stuff you never had to do before because you were at home. So adjustment to home life. And I, I guess that's why the divorce percentage is so high among football <laughs> players. Because that's the toughest part is how am I going to function with this family in this household that I haven't been at for the last 10 years. So that part of it to me, being human again, being normal again, was, was probably the biggest transition. And, and you gotta know, from 6.30 to 6.30, you got a schedule. It's like, you come in, you eat breakfast, you go to the training table, you go get treatment or whatnot. And then when it's done, it's like, oh man, I gotta make my own schedule here. And it was tough. One last thing. What spoiled me the most is, you go out here, you sweat it up, you practice, you go in the locker, you drop your stuff right where they are, you wrap a towel around you, you run to the shower, you come back, and guess what? All of that stuff is gone. It's gone. You got clean stuff already up, ready for the next day. And when you take that mentality and attitude home to your wife, to your girlfriend, your spouse, you're doomed. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, man, that is so good. The, you know, the transition, I know for me, I think the, the hardest part for me was, you know, you get done and there's almost a little bit of a relief. I know there's, you're like, oh man, I don't have that structure. And then two weeks after it's like, man, nobody cares what I'm doing. <laughs> you're sitting there like, all right, I'm, now I can go do whatever I want. I have nothing to do. So the transition, and I agree with you, a lot of people are, it's easy. You see now and you see when the guys are retired, the years that they played, it's almost like that's on your your, your cemetery plot. Right. It's 2000 to 2011, whatever it is. That part of your life is over. You either start figuring out a way to transition and do something different, or you are going to be in a deep spell. There you go. That's so uh, the transition is tough. So I guess, what are you guys doing now? What what have you been able to do to help you know ease the transition moving forward? Um, now I'm I didn't got in. I'm a workout fanatic. I like to work out. So. I went and um, invested in the gym. Um, I'm training um, high school kids um, on the side now, uh, helping them to show them the game, show them how to play the game right, show them how to eat right, show them how to be safe playing this game. And um, it, it's keeping me busy. Uh, it's keeping me in the game. Um, it's keeping my head level. It's keeping that structure in place um, because the kids, uh, they're, not, they're not pros yet. So you still got to detail them up. And, and make sure they, they know how to play this game right because one, once the kids that I'm training get there, the game will be bigger, faster, and stronger. So um, you got to teach the kids right. So life right now is very, very content. Do you almost feel, and before we go to Antonio, that you're now paying it forward, you're mentoring, you're doing something to help other kids live the dream that you were able to live? Yeah, I, I don't want a dollar for it. I, I made enough money. I'm Like I said, I'm very content. I, I just do it for the love of the game. I like to see kids being successful. I, I just like to see them stand out of trouble. That's the big thing right now with kids. And uh, you know, showing them the right way and showing them the right way to do this thing. And so much is made about professional athletes not giving back. I think everything Jermichael just sat here and said is about him giving back. Him giving this knowledge of being a, a star in the NFL to some young kids. He doesn't have to do that. He can go sit home on his rocking chair and do whatever he wants, but he's giving back. And there's so much that professional athletes don't get credit for 
Because a lot of times we're not boastful about the things we're doing, but that's giving back. I mean, for me, uh, I've, I've honeymooned with some television, pre- and post-game shows, uh, some radio with ESPN Milwaukee. I've done some work with The Fan. I've done some work with The Zone. And like Jermichael, I helped transition college wide receiver pro prospects to the pro game. So each year I get about five wide receivers that are graduating from college with dreams of being drafted or going to the NFL. And my job is to work with them and transition their game from the college level to what the coaches and they want at the professional level. So I'm able to call some of my old colleagues and get information from guys like Edgar Bennett and so on and pass that down to these young guys, which will in turn give them a better chance to make the roster and have a long, healthy career in the NFL. I mean, I think it's great. You guys giving back and doing the doing that stuff to give you know kids a chance to do the same thing that you guys are doing. Paying it for it is outstanding. And again, our conversation today being live streamed on Blue Jeans Network and will be archived on the Players Tribune. And one of the things the Players Tribune likes to do is let you give advice to your younger self. So for you guys both, if you could go back, talk to yourself on draft night. And only give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? On draft night. I thought he was talking about it throughout my career. <laughs> um, through draft night. Just make the best of it. You're in a rare situation. This is a rare opportunity. People, millions of people all over the world would give anything to be in your shoes. Just don't have any regrets. And if there's any kids out here, whatever you do in life, don't have any regrets. And my, my thing was coming in, if I can talk to my younger self, I, I would say just have fun with it. Um, because when you get on the field, you're just so tensed up and tight. Um, I don't know where it comes from. I guess the pressure from the contracts. <laughs> you want more money. But other than that, be a kid. Have fun with it. Enjoy it. Um, it, it only happens once. And it is called the NFL, not for long. So you, got, you just got to have fun. Have fun with it. Nice work. So now we're going to take a couple of questions. We have three online questions from the Blue Jeans Network. Let's pull those up. My cell phone. <laughs> Hi, dear Michael. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How about you? Say it again. I can't hear you, buddy. I'm doing well. How about you? Hey, how you doing, man? I'm doing awesome. So my Talk question, so my question was, I mean, you had an, an almost unfortunate, pretty unfortunate neck injury that ended your career. And Antonio, you stayed pretty lucky in terms of injuries. What advice would you give to younger NFL players about staying healthy and keeping their bodies in great shape? Uh, it's, you know, I mean, not not putting so much stress on your body because I know high school ball, uh, the coaches run y'all to death just back and forth, back and forth, and don't have like a, a tolerance for the body. The body only can take so much. And uh, for younger guys, I would say maintain. Don't push your body too early uh, because, once again, you have a long life to live, um, uh, a young, young, healthy life right now in high school. Just enjoy it. Uh, don't take it serious, but just don't take it too serious where you uh, lose focus of uh, what real life is all about. Thank you. Great answer. No problem, man. All right. That's free. What do you think? I mean, from just from a standpoint of health-wise, now the nutrition is so much better than it was when, you know, we were getting chicken wings and some other stuff. You know, what, what do you think? It, obviously, it's an important part of today's NFL. Yeah, I mean, back then we ate ice cream and fried chicken wings and spaghetti pasta. At 9 o'clock at night before our game on Sunday, and everybody ate it. Um, but now it's more about health, longevity, safety of the football game, and you have to take care of your body. It's not just going out on Sundays playing. You have to have a nutritionist. You have to eat fruit, vegetables, drink a ton of water, and there's certain things that you have to give up, soda, 
uh, other carbonated drinks that won't help you stay hydrated on a football field. So there's definitely a nutritional educational aspect to it now more than it was. Definitely. Okay, let's take another question on the Blue Jeans Network. Hey guys. Hey. Can't see you, buddy. There, there you go. You go. Hey. <laughs> um, this is a question for Antonio. I just wanted to ask who is the toughest player you've ever played against? It's really not a player. It was nothing tougher than playing against our own defense on a practice field on Friday when they had a script of every play you were going to run from 1 to 20. That was the toughest thing at practice. When a guy across from you knows you're ready to run an in-breaking route, so he mysteriously on this play lines up on the inside to try to prevent you from getting inside. So the things and the challenges that our own defense presented to us throughout the week of practice was way tougher than matching up against any one person on any other good, good team. Although I did have the privilege to play against Deion Sanders, and he was probably one of the most amazing defensive backs, if you get to watch him on film, that I've ever seen play. What made Deion so good? And then also, he ever talk a little trash to you? Well, he was definitely very confident. You have to have confidence to play in this game. Sometimes it goes along borderline cockiness, but you got to have it. And he was extremely fast. He was probably the fastest guy in the NFL. So he could make you seem like he was giving you an inside release when he knew what your next move was. And he had so much speed that he could cut you off and disrupt the play just based on his speed. But not just his speed. He also studied the game. He studied the way a guy lines up, what position he is on the field. And when you have speed and wisdom the way that Deion Sanders did, that's why he was able to lock down one side of the field, as they say, because he had elite attributes. And with those type of skill sets, you have nothing to do but be great. All right, let's take another question online on the Blue Jeans Network. Buffering. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, this is really awesome. I uh, really appreciate your time. We talked about, you know, taking care of your body when you're in high school. There's a whole mental thing about getting ready to you know, think about dreams about the NFL. How do you talk to kids when they ask you, you know, what's special? What, what, what's that X factor that's going to help me make it to a pro sport? like the NFL? Just, just really being honest. Um, for one, take it day by day. Uh, for two, um, injuries. Uh, as a young kid, uh, bones heal a little bit faster than they do when I uh, retired or whatnot. But as a kid, staying healthy, um, eating right, getting them in a proper sleep, not staying up all types of nights, playing the video games and doing all that, and just really just focusing on your craft. Um, and like I said, just not take it so serious, like have, be a kid and have fun and, uh, and, uh, life will take you wherever it wants to. I think you have to have a good team around you. And when I say team, I'm not talking about the Green Bay Packers. I'm talking about, you gotta have great parents. You have to have great coaches and teachers at a young age, because what you instill in a kid at a young age carries them through the rest of their life. So if you can start by having those things in place, having consequences for your kids, having a curfew, having expectations scholastically, because education is the number one thing that you still need to be a great football player. We talked about how big that book is. You got to know how to read to read through that book. You have to know how to have problem-solving skills, because as I mentioned about Deion Sanders lining up on the inside, knowing I'm running an inside break. Well, I have to be a problem solver because he just took away what I wanted to do, but I have to have a backup plan if plan A doesn't work. So education and just being a good problem solver because being a 
NFL football player, hey, we practice how we think it's going to be a lot throughout the week. But on Sunday, a lot of times, it's totally different than what you spent the last five days on focusing on. So you have to have problem-solving abilities. All right, let's take another question online on the Blue Jeans Network. Yeah, it's free. It's always, Jermichael, smartest players are the best players almost always. Would you agree? All right, go ahead, guys. Okay, yeah, I'd like to know from both of you, uh, which NFL players did you uh, grow up idolizing and watching? Nice. Um, I live in Texas now, so ah, I know the Packers fans not going to like me. But yeah, uh, I don't, I, it. don't do it. Don't do it. But I watch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I grew up watching the Dallas Cowboys, Troy Aitman, Emmitt Smith, and good old Michael Irvin. So um, <laughs> them, them were the guys that I. Uh, Michael Irvin was a guy that I I mimicked my game after. Of. Um, I liked the way he he uh, he was a little cocky with it, but still brung the game uh, to the field. So uh, the the Dallas Cowboys. And for me, same team, different era. I was a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan. And you got to give me some pity here. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Our team left us in a Mayflower truck and went to Cleveland. So I was stuck without a team. And the Dallas Cowboys, I loved Drew Pearson. I loved Tony Dorsett, Roger Starback. Butch Johnson was one of their wide receivers. He scored a touchdown and get up and shoot his guns and I was just in love with the star. I was just becoming a teenager. I was figuring out about the show Dallas, the TV show, and everything about Dallas just seemed right then. So I did grow up a Dallas Cowboys fan, and Roger Staubach, Drew Pearson, you name it. But since 1995, it's been go, Pat, go. I love it. Go, Pat. Go. <laughs> uh, we're going to take two more questions on the Blue Jeans Network, if we can fire that up. Perfect. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, good day, guys. It's uh, over here from Australia, so thank you very much for the thank opportunity. Um, what was your... Uh, what, what was your... Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Can't hear you, buddy. Can you hear Say it again. Can you guys hear me okay? Said, who's your favorite Green Bay Packer? Besides me, who's your oh, favorite? Oh, my favorite Green Bay Packer. I got to say Antonio Freeman. <laughs> no, seriously, though, Antonio Freeman. Uh, I, I, I just think he was a great receiver, uh, great guy now that I know him. And um, you just, this guy, he's going to bring the same guy. Every time when you, when you see him, he's always he's always steady for sure. Um, for me, as much as I want to say Jermichael, <laughs> I gotta say number four. He was the guy that I counted on to get me to football, and through our connections and our hard work and those late nights of going in his room of dating the quarterback, as Jermichael told you about. We were able to accumulate 57 touchdowns together. Um, so I was always in awe at what he was able to do week after week, fighting those injuries, going through what he d went through in the, in the mid-90s uh, with the addiction to Vicodin and so on and so on. How he was able to, through it all, be the same player and win the NFL MVP three years in a row, I think, Says a lot about the type of player that number four was. Yeah, yeah, awesome. so we're going to take our last question. That was pretty cool. A question from Australia. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I, you were going to say something about putting a shrimp on the Barbie. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Antonio and Jermichael, thank you so much for conducting this live Q&A. Um, we're huge fans. We live in, in Atlanta, Georgia. There's not many Packers here. So Max is going to ask you the question that's on everybody's mind. Talk to me. Do you think the Packers have a chance to win the Super Bowl this year? I do. I think the Packers have a strong, strong team this year. Um, they got a lot of young guys, a lot of hungry guys that's ready to play. And um, I, I, think, I think we will be seeing them in a the bowl game for sure. I think them guys are ready over there. 
I also I, agree. I think last year we had a pretty good shot to go. But when you lose a guy of, of great significance like a Jordy Nelson early on in the season, you, you go through the struggles that, that Eddie Lacy went through at the running back position, trying to get a balance offensively. To have those components back, I think we have a real legitimate shot. And I'm not just saying this as a homer. If we can keep those guys healthy and keep that offensive line healthy, because that's where we struggled a lot last year as well, is when our offensive tackles and guards were getting hurt, guys had to play different positions. So if we can keep everything intact and we keep talking about health, health, we got to stay healthy, they can get back because it's an offensive game now. And we can score points with anybody in the league. So I think we got a good shot. I couldn't agree more. I want to thank everybody for jumping on the Blue Jeans Network and, and asking those great questions. We're going to take a few questions from the crowd. Scott, go ahead. My name's Savannah Shepard. My question was, what was your favorite memory of the Packers? My favorite memory of the Packers was flying into Green Bay. And um, my first hotel, well, coming into training camp, they had us stay right there at the Wingate Hotel. And that was, oh man, it was it was crazy. And I will remember that until I, I, I leave this place. It, it was it was different. Uh, we that's where we had our our meetings, our rookie meetings and all. So I'm like, when am I going to leave this hotel? Is it anything else in Green Bay, Wisconsin? They have a nice continental breakfast there. I, I need more than that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, being at, flying into Green Bay and going to the Wingate Hotel was a it was a memory that that would really stick with me. Hey, staying at the Wingate is like staying in the Hamptons if you're in New York because we had to stay at this hotel back the here. The Motor Lodge. The Motor Lodge. We had to shack up at the Motor Lodge during my rookie campaign. So I'm looking at the Wingate like, that's Beverly Hills. What are you talking about? <laughs> but for me, my greatest memory as a Packer, obviously, was one I shared with all of my teammates, everyone who works in the offices, and that was winning Super Bowl 31 in New Orleans. It was something that not only I achieved, but everybody associated with the Green Bay Packers, our fans, our front office, our marketing department. We were all champions. So to me, popping that champagne, getting champagne stuck in your eyes, I'll do it all over again for that one. Hi, I'm Jolie, and my question was, what was your favorite field to play except Lambeau Field? Oh, nice. My great favorite. question and great face painting, too. That looks great. My, my favorite field um, was Seattle. It was just so electric once you enter that Loud. stadium. Oh, um, the only thing I didn't like about it, I love the fans there. Um, I love to see my Packer Nation there. But uh, you get plenty offside penalties. I was jumping my butt off. It. <laughs> I was jumping my butt off in Seattle. But Seattle is one of them places that um, if you're a Packer fan and and Green Bay ever play the Seahawks, you got to go check it out because it's, it's something special. For me, it was the Chicago Bears because we kicked their butt every time we went down there. <laughs> and it always amazed me, how can we have better footing on your home field? Those guys slipped and slid all over the field where, of course, we have a great equipment staff, our master equipment staff manager, Red Batty, made sure that our cleats and our footing was proper when we went down there. So it was always fun to watch those guys slip and fall, and we just keep on running for touchdown after touchdown. I can tell you that's the, that's the worst field in the NFL, that's, and that's a fact. <laughs> I just like the results when we went there. My name is Greg Shepard, and um, did you play Pop Horner? Man, I, I've been playing football since I was five years old. Five. Um, but another thing, I stayed in Texas, too. So Texas football is, um, is something to see. Um, but uh, I stuck with it all the way through. Um, and then I stopped playing football uh, when I got to high school because my grandmother, she did not want me to get hit. She was like, boy, you ain't going out there getting hit. So I stopped, went back uh, my junior year. And um, in high school, and uh, started playing receiver. So uh, I started playing football very, very young. I did play Pop Warner, and for the parents out there that are a little nervous about your kids, 
That's where you learn how to play the game. You're only dealing with 50, 60, 70 pound guys. When you get up to high school, now you're dealing with 200, 250 pound guys. So now that collision is a little more intense than when you're that age. So if you allow your kid to play Pop Warner, make sure they're learning how to play the game, learn how to tackle, learn how to protect the football. This is where hopefully you put enough work in so that you prevent the injuries long term. But you got to learn the game. So that's what Pop Warner should be about, learning the game, not winning. Good advice. Uh, listen, we're going to take our last question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Joe Colwell, and I had one question. What would, if you guys had any regrets in football, what would it be? Regrets. Any regrets. Once again, Free is talking about learning how to play football, and Pop Warner, that's when you detail, detail the kids up. My regret would be catching the ball and actually making a move and not lowering my head when I got injured. Oh, uh, I, I blame, I blame, I blame myself too on the injury too, because I caught the ball and I lowered my head, and when I looked up, I was like, man, I wish I could take this play back, because I can't not move on this field. So if I, if I had to take it all back, I I'll take that catch back for sure. Um, for me, it would have been extending my career a little longer. I was fortunate enough to play 10 years, but because I couldn't humble myself to accept a lesser role than being the starting player, I probably forfeited myself about three to four years of annual income that I missed out on on the back end of my career because I was so accustomed to being the starter, to being one of the guys that when it came time for me to be a teacher and show other guys how to be professionals, I kind of lost interest. So I kind of wish... I had a better mindset in year 10 when they're asking you not to be a starter, but to be a backup and help develop the younger guy's talent. So that really is my biggest regret when I look back at my career is those last three or four years that what if type years. You guys, uh, I, I don't know about you guys. Let's give a big round of applause to Antonio Freeman and to Michael Finley. That was that was great getting insight and getting a little bit from these two. I want to thank American Family Insurance, the Players Tribune, Blue Jeans Network, and the Green Bay Packers for allowing us to put this on. You guys have anything else you want to say? Thanks for having us. It's always great to come back to Lambeau in the city of, state of Wisconsin. Every time I feel like a rock star, and it's because of you, so thank you. Right. Go, go, Pack, go. And with that, we thank you guys very much for coming out. Have a great weekend.